Welcome to the Highland Wonders podcast, where we share stories and knowledge from experts about the charismatic species and diverse ecosystems of the Okanagan Highlands of North Central Washington. My name is Jen Weddle, and I am one of the co-directors of Okanagan Highlands Alliance a nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to protecting the beautiful Okanagan Highlands. Along with each Highland Wonders podcast episode, we write an accompanying short story about the adventures of five-year-old Jack, the nature detective, as he explores the Okanagan Highlands. I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to our local paper, the Okanagan Valley Gazette Tribune, for printing the stories throughout the winter. You can also find these stories on our website, okanaganhighlands.org backslash Highland Wonders. Now back to the nature detective. The main character is based on a real life kid. The stories contain the observations and questions of a real five-year-old. This particular child is cool, and it has been pretty amazing to hear the way Jack puts together the information he gathers to make sense of his world. Some of the things he says are funny, like Chickens can fly three cars high. And some are dead on accurate. Bats have wings with little thumbs on the end. Some are kind of rambling. Sheep are brown, goats are white, and I don't know what their kids are called. And some are a little zany, but rooted in something real. Chickens lay eggs on like bats that have live birds. What I am trying to get at here is that this kid, kids in general, are amazing scientists and have great things to share. If there are any kids listening, take a grown up outside and show them stuff. Share your observations and questions, collect information together, and work on solving nature mysteries and finding new things to ask questions about. It's fun. And spring is coming, an action-packed time for nature. This episode features the common loon, a bird so charismatic, so endearing, so fascinating that we challenge you not to be curious about them. Here are some things the nature detective has to say. Loons sound like a wolf and a chicken at the same time. A weirdly accurate statement. And... In the winter, they need to protect themselves. They don't have warm tails like foxes. They probably don't hibernate. Bears and frogs hibernate. Maybe they fly somewhere. There really aren't many nesting loons in Washington state anymore. Thus the title of the episode. But the Okanagan Highlands is one of their preferred places to spend the summer and raise young. Over the years, Ginger and Daniel Polishuk have partnered with OHA in the winter at our speaker series and in the summer while conducting research. They are generous in sharing their knowledge of the common loon and what people can do to protect them. They are researchers, conservationists, and educators, and we and the loons are lucky to have them working to protect this remarkable species. So enjoy. It's a real pleasure to be here. The title of our program tonight, Washington's Not-So-Common Loon. Some of the content Ginger is more familiar with, and uh, some of the content I think I'm about equally familiar with, so she'll pop up now and then and and add her little uh, input. Such Um, as, that's why the marriage works so well. He always gives me all the credit. (laughs) (laughs) We've been involved with uh, studying the common loon since 1996, and it's taken us to a lot of different places, and we've enjoyed it so far. The common loon is just absolutely adored among people. It has a very sleek outline. It's very streamlined. It has very nice plumage. It has that prominent bill and that gorgeous red eye. It's a wonderful parent. It has great calls. People adore the common loon for a variety of reasons. One of our uh, avenues of study with these common loons is we ban them so that we know their identity. We learn a tremendous amount about the behavior and the lifestyles of common loons if we know their individuality. 
And to do that, we give them names, but of course they don't understand their name or respond to that. So we have to ban them. There's a Bonaparte female that uh, we banded originally in 1995, long, long time ago. We know that she's had at least 18 nesting seasons at Bonaparte Lake. So she has survived three or four different husbands that we know about. And she now has a, a partner that's pretty ineffective. I think it's a young dude, and he just doesn't know how to handle things. So she's the take-charge adult at Bonaparte Lake. We learn more because we ban these birds than any other part of our conservation work for them. We band at age six weeks, something like that, when their leg is large enough to retain the band so it won't slip off, and they're still fairly easy to capture. The older they get, the harder it is for us to capture them. So we try to ban them at this interval that's around the July 4th time period each summer. When we capture these birds, they're extremely dangerous. They like to go for your eyes. So uh, since they weigh right around 10 pounds usually, they're, they're quite, an, quite an effort to hold them calm. Actually, it's the bill that's dangerous that you need. You know, I think that's what Dan's yeah. referring to, is the mm -hmm. bill is dangerous. Yeah, uh, there's one account in the literature of a guy that lost an eye from handling a common loon. We do a complete measurement of the birds when we capture them, morphometrics, and then we ban them, and we do a real calm, safe release. Common loons are excellent divers. Their legs are placed near the back part of their body, and they are very dense in terms of their bone structure, so they sink very easily. Most birds are very buoyant, but common loons have dense bones. They're not hollow like most birds. So diving is very easy, and they can propel themselves through the water actually faster than they can on the top swimming along the surface. So when they have a large distance to go and they want to get there quickly, they'll dive and, and do it more rapidly that way. How common loons take off, they get to the far end of the lake and then they face into the wind and they start their takeoff. And they have to run along the surface of the water a great distance to actually become airborne. It takes about six seconds to get airborne if they have a typical headwind. They have to be going at least 60 miles an hour to be able to take off. Their angle of attack is, is very low. They climb very slowly. So they can't land on a small lake. If they do, they may not be able to get off. We've seen loons trapped before on, on small lakes. Another thing that they have to consider is when they come in in the springtime, they have to have a substantial amount of the lake that's not frozen so that they can be able to take off from that lake. So they have a lot of things to consider because it takes a major effort for them to be become airborne. Common loons can just barely fly. They're not great flyers. They have what's called high wing loading in that their wings are small in comparison to their weight, so they have to make up for it with just speed. So they only fly to get from one place to another. There's nothing cute and fancy about loon flight. It's straight and direct, no twists and turns. It's just taking off, flying, and then landing. So to give you a comparison, the Canada goose has two and a half times less wing loading than the common loon, and the raven has six times less wing loading than the common loon. And both of those species can twist and turn and, and take off very rapidly, but the common loon cannot. And they'll often make calls during their flight. Uh, we'll play one of those for you called the flight tremolo in just a little bit. They fly very rapidly. Uh, they have been clocked at nearly 100 miles an hour, but their average speed is something like 60 or 55 miles an hour when they migrate. We know because we've put transmitters on some of them, and we plot from A to B and calculate the speed, and it, it turns out to be around 60 miles per hour. Their approach to landing, they come in and perform kind of a stall where they're trying to slow down their airspeed. They come in at 60 to 70 miles an hour to start off, and sometimes when we were on these lakes, we would actually hear them arriving before we would see them. They come in so rapidly, you know, we can be paying no attention to the direction they're coming in. And then all of a sudden we hear this, and then sure enough, there's a loon and it lands. So uh, it's quite exciting to see. They put their feet out to the back and use that as kind of a stabilizing rudder. 
their feet actually make contact with the water initially, and then they slide on their belly to a stop. And sometimes when it's rough, this can be quite an experience. If, if there are waves on the lake, why, you, you know, it's, it's quite an experience to see a loon land. They have to do a lot of conditioning of their feathers because they're in the water virtually all the time. And if their feathers aren't in good conditioning, then they're prone to hypothermia. They would get cold. So they're a warm-blooded creature, so they have to prevent that. They move around the oil from their uropygial gland, which is near the base of their tail, so they spread around that oil and condition their feathers, and they do that a lot during the daytime. And they'll sometimes bathe for 15 to 20 minutes at a time. They move a lot of water, and they get in crazy positions. And then common loons will perform a wing flap when they're done with their bathing and printing. It throws away the extra water uh, out of their feathers. They're trying to stay warm. They've got to keep their body temperature regulated. And so if they can run a lot of the water out from between their feathers, that helps with their thermoregulation. It also helps condition their flight muscles. It takes special talent to hold a fish for the young and wing flap at the same time. A foot waggle, where they'll actually flap their feet out to sling the extra water off, and then they'll tuck it under their wing just before they uh, take a nap. And that way they don't drag all of that cold water up next to their body as it's positioned under their wing. We even see young chicks doing this. They learn all this behavior very quickly. When they're really intent on sleeping, they'll actually turn their head around and position their bill between their two wings. And then after they wake up, they'll give a little stretch, kind of like we do in the morning. And uh, most of the time, they don't get enough sleep. There's enough on the lake to keep them awake more than they would like to be. The next segment here that we want to start Common loons have a variety of calls. It's one of their real intriguing aspects of, of their behavior and their lifestyle. This is the whale call. Ginger will play this for you. So that's the whale. This is a communication call that they use. It's kind of like, I'm here, where are you? Like when they want to communicate with their partner or with their chicks. So this is a very common call that they use for notification and to tell people where they are. Uh, this is the tremolo. This lower mandible goes up and down five times per second, producing the tremolo call, and Ginger will play that for us. So that's what we call uh, the tremolo, and that's kind of like a surprise call. It's like, you've surprised me, you're too close, I'm going to leave. That's the context that they use when they give the tremolo. And sometimes they'll do a tremolo duet, which really disrupts the activity on the lake because it's noisy and boisterous, and everybody thinks that uh, somebody's trying to kill the loons out there when this happens. It's, uh, it's quite a sound to behold. They also call, I think you've heard this call being the laughing call or the maniacal call. Actually, the loons are quite stressed during this time. They're not laughing and having a good time at all. So it's a very stressful time when they're doing the tremolo. They're, they're very alarmed. They also give a tremolo call while they're flying, and it's called the flight tremolo. The yodel is a call that's given only by the male. It is a territorial call. The males demonstrate that they're willing to defend this territory, they're going to defend their partner and their chicks and the lake that they're at. So it's a warning to other males, to other uh, territorial adults to stay away, this lake is occupied. So we'll play for you now the yodel call. Several loons involved here. Those are more distant. So that's the yodel call. The old man is mouthing off. He's defending his territory. Oftentimes, uh, when loons come back to do their nesting on the fresh water, they'll come back from the coastlines where they spend their winters, and sometimes they arrive too early. Oftentimes, the male will be the first one to arrive at a territorial lake. If we were to average all things out, typically the male arrives initially because he's the guy that really wants to take charge of the territory. 
they don't spend the winters together. That's probably different than you thought, I'm not sure, but uh, people say that loons mate for life. Actually, that's not quite true. They mate with each other in a succession of years as long as that works. If there's mortality, of course, that ends. And if there are takeovers from another male or female that comes in, of course, that will end that union. For the most part, that's true. They mate for as long as that continues to work, which is really the way nature operates. If something works, keep it going. And that's how they perpetuate their species. And so they get together and they kind of uh, work on their pair bonding for a couple of weeks, waiting around for the optimal time to start nesting. During this time period, they'll do some socializing. Sometimes other loons will fly in from other lakes. And loons like to get in these kind of clusters. They, they call it the circle dance, where they'll kind of swim around in a circle and uh, just kind of view each other. It's kind of like going out to the bar, you know, see who's in town. We'll go down to the community center and see a program. It works for loons. Sometimes this goes a little too far, and the territorial adult gets excited about it, and he suddenly seems threatened by everything. They're highly territorial. He'll lunge, uh, he'll, he'll defend his territory. And this is what loons do when things get too close to them. Could be another loon, it could be a beaver, it could be a fisherman. It could be photographers taking pictures of loons. Sometimes actual battles ensue where they all come into contact with each other. They try to spear with their upper mandible. And sometimes one bird will start what we call wing rowing, where they'll race across the water very rapidly with the other bird chasing them. So then the uh, male and female will kind of spend um, the early part of the spring working on their pair bonding. They'll demonstrate courtship. It's not elaborate. It's uh, usually something like this. They'll swim in a circle, and they'll do bill dipping. This is kind of an acceptance posture. I think you're pretty cute. Yeah, so are you. I'm accepting you. You're not a threat to me. So uh, let's get it on, or whatever. So then they... Um, They'll often choose a nest site up on the shore. They're always trying to nest adjacent to the water. They'll actually breed, usually, on the chosen nest site. And then following breeding, they'll start nest construction. And the way they do that is to grab bits of mud and vegetation and sling it up into the area that they think they will be making a nest. So some of this, we think, is ceremonial because their tosses are highly inaccurate. Sometimes it goes left, sometimes it goes right. Oftentimes, it doesn't come anywhere near where you could call a nest. And then actual nesting starts usually right around the 1st of May, weather permitting. All things considered, if it's an average year, it's usually around the 1st of May. Loons like to nest on islands because it's a way to keep away from predators. They won't have any mammal predators if they can get on an island. That's their preference. If they don't have islands available, then they'll choose a shoreline that is pretty much inaccessible to mammalian predators, where they can just slip into the water and, and get away quickly. We know that from year to year, they choose different prominences in the vegetation to construct their nest. The eggs are about three inches long and two inches wide. They're speckled black. Sometimes they're a little more toward the brown uh, color spectrum. Two eggs is a typical clutch size. Second most frequent is one egg, and really, really rare occurrences happen with three eggs. But they're poorly documented in the, in the literature and in some cases not even believed. What we like to do around nests to keep beagles away, we take dead alders and just kind of position them around the, the nest. We force them down into the mud substrate, and that keeps the eagles away from chasing off the adults. It's extremely effective. We first got this idea by watching eagles trying to chase off the adults, and we thought, well, if we put up a structure there, it'll be, uh, you know, at least beneficial. So we tried it, and in most cases, the loons will just continue to sit on the nest. They know us so well from the hundreds of hours that we're around them photographing and studying them that they accept us. And other people that are working with loons in other states now are adopting this same technique to keep eagles away from chasing the adults and it's very effective. So while the nesting is going on, usually the partner will be offshore and uh, just kind of patrolling, making sure that everything is copacetic. And when they do a nest exchange, they'll frequently turn the eggs. Common loons, they persist no matter what the weather is like in their nesting. It doesn't bother a bird that dives a lot. 
to sit there in the rain. It's just kind of like normal. Sometimes the wind will be blowing and the temperatures will get very low, but the loons will stay right on those eggs. They have to incubate those eggs for about 26 to 28 days before they hatch. One of the issues that Bonaparte has is they have um, rapidly rising water after they close the dam. And usually the dam is closed about the final week of nesting for the loon. And she probably has lost more of her chicks or eggs from rapidly rising water. So we're trying to mitigate for that, and we have moved her nest with eggs onto a floating platform. The eggs were about a half inch above the rising water, two eggs, and we, the female would not accept the nest until the male came back, and he was gone, oh, about four some hours. As soon as he came back, he checked things out and climbed right up on top of the nest and looked at her like, well, what's your problem? How come you're not on this nest? What's going on? It didn't bother him at all, and the chicks hatched, and we called them the Miracle Twins. We're starting to put in various lakes where we think a common loon could be aided by an artificial nesting platform. It's kind of a, like an enlarged Brillo pad. It floats well, and we put on branches to keep eagles away. Bald eagles in the state decimate the young, the common loon young. That's their biggest predator. So that's our effort to stave off the eagles. We only have 12 to 13 nesting pairs of common loons each year in the state of Washington. So only, that's all we have. And so we're working at the range edge of their breeding. And it's kind of a challenging place to work because we get to see really what affects the population of the breeding common loons. We're able to see all of the different reasons why their nests fail. We are able to see why their nests succeed. So working at the range edge, you're able to see what's happening with that range. Is it contracting or is it expanding? And in actuality, the common loon nesting range has been contracting. In uh, 1976, for instance, they nested all the way as far south as northern California. Now there are no common loons nesting in California nor Oregon. They've been extirpated in Idaho and nearly in Washington. So we've kind of taken on this challenge to try to keep the common loon nesting in the state of Washington. We're down to 12 to 13 pairs. So it's kind of a sobering thing to think about. They incubate the eggs about 26 to 28 days, and then they finally hatch. At day one or day two, they actually start feeding little tiny invertebrates to their young. They don't intend to feed them any vegetation. They're, they're strictly invertebrate eaters, and then eventually they'll be large enough to take small fish. Uh, the adults will peer below the water surface so that they can see if there's any danger approaching their chick. This is how they check. They learn this from being in areas where there are a lot of predators. Around the coastlines in salt water, there are a tremendous number of predators, so they learn this behavior. In many parts of the north-central parts of North America, there are our northern pike, a lot of different types of fish that can easily swallow a young chick. So the adults watch for that, and the adults will actually swim down and chase away predators. In Washington, we don't have too many of those kind of predator fish, fortunately. So they start out, and they head for a marsh. Once uh, both chicks have hatched, the adults will take them down to an area where they can actually find a lot of grubs and different invertebrates for the adults to feed the young. Usually, the chicks will start trying to dive on their second or third day. Just instinctively, they see something overhead and they'll try to get, get down. But they're so buoyant when, when they're that age that they can't dive. They, they just kind of bounce along on the surface. They have such high surface area. Uh, back riding is something that happens for the first two weeks. The young chicks will get up on top of the backs of the adults because it's safe there. They can maintain their body temperature a lot better up there. And, of course, it's safe from predators. And also, they can rest. They tire very quickly because they're so small. Uh, chicks love to play in the water. They love to play around. They're adventuresome, and uh, they like to see how much water they can move around with their bill. They're playful. They're mischievous. It's amazing some of the things we capture with a camera. We take rapid frames, and then sometimes we're really surprised when we put it up on the monitor. Parents feed the young chicks. They start off with invertebrates, like I mentioned. Uh, dragonfly invertebrates are very common. Vegetation just kind of comes along with it. Some of the people that wrote early about this behavior were saying 
that they're feeding vegetation to their chicks. They don't mean to. It just kind of comes along with it. They they're strictly depend on the invertebrates for food value. And then eventually they'll get, after three or four days, they're able to take fish. Probably uh, two weeks, something like that, and it's able to take fish probably four inches. So they'll swallow it. They have to wrestle around with it for a while, but they, they learn to take it head first. Uh, they try it other ways. They try it sideways, uh, tail first, you know, and uh, they quickly learn what works. When eagles come around, everybody is attentive. Uh, bald eagles try to get the chicks, and uh, sometimes they succeed. They learn that the adults pay a lot of attention to bald eagles. They learn that the adults pay virtually no attention to osprey. Osprey don't go after young chicks, and the adults know that. But they know very di distinctively that the bald eagle will go for their young. The very earliest we've ever seen loons fly is in week 11. Typically, it's week 12 or week 13. At this time, they're about exactly the same size and weight as their adult parents. And then week 13, they're flying around. Week 14, they're able to go from lake to lake. If they choose to do that, they could migrate. Oftentimes, about this time, the adults will leave the lake and let them fend for themselves. They're old enough to do that. The adults like to migrate early and get away from the pestering of the youngsters because they can really, really start begging. Mm -hmm. Alhai Lake is one of their migration staging lakes. We found the loons that we had been associated with at Ferry Lake down at Alhai Lake. Alhai Lake is uh, southwest of Republic, almost to the uh, Columbia River. Alhai Lake, actually, you know, it's on the reservation, but it's an important migration lake for Washington's loons. The Bonaparte loons and also Lost Lake loons land there and their chicks going back and forth to the winter territory. What we call a migration staging lake, a large number of loons band together. They're all migrants. We see a mixture of adults and chicks that are there at that time. Different adults that are on these migration staging lakes in their various changes in their plumage. So we'll talk about plumage progression here a little bit. Common loons change their plumage as they go from season to season, going away from breeding plumage, going toward winter, what we call basic plumage. The bill is becoming white instead of black. Uh, most of the feathers are, are gone that have the, the checkers and the dots. The necklaces are gone, and it looks like quite a different bird. In midwinter, all of the spots are gone. Sometimes you'll see a remnant few here or there. This is going to be the bird that you're, the loon plumage that you will see along the Columbia River, Lake Pateros, in the wintertime. So you may have, you probably know this loon quite well in the winter. And then in the spring, as it gets its breeding plumage, they then move away and go to their breeding lakes. We did a winter survey two winters ago. And we went from uh, Lake Pateros all the way up to Roosevelt Lake. We did a stretch of 104 miles, and we counted 110 common loons overwintering on the Columbia River. And that's something that was not known before. Nobody knew that common loons wintered on the Columbia River. Actually, so, Washington, um, the entire Columbia, from about Sewilla Basin on down to the, the Gap. To Portland? To Wallula well, Wallula Gap. Gap. Mm -hmm. And a few on down the Columbia River. Loons over winter. In fact, there are hundreds of loons, and our intent is to go ahead and document this because uh, we'll probably get into a thousand loons overwintering on the Columbia, which is fresh water. And we also have some that go to salt water, uh, Puget Sound, the coast of Washington. But Washington is the only state that has nesting common loons that. The loons will overwinter on fresh water and salt water. So it's a very unique state. Great we, place to study. We also have loons from Canada and Alaska coming down in this area, too. Uh, when loons are in salt water, they'll often forage on crabs. And during about six or seven weeks in the wintertime, they're actually flightless because they lose their wing feathers. In actuality, you better have a well-established territory on your winter territory. You better know where the foraging is good because you can't fly to another place. You can only swim to another place, and 
Puget Sound's a big place, and so is the Pacific. So uh, you better know what you're doing. Eventually, then toward late winter and on into February and March, the feathers start to grow back. The, the checkers are coming back in. The necklace is starting to develop. The bill is now going back to black, and the eye gets more intense red. They can't fly until about the end of March, when their wing feathers are more fully developed and, and more stiff to enable them to lift and provide flight. Now, the question was, what causes the eye to change color from a, a kind of a drab brown to intense red? I don't know that. If there are biologists in the crowd that do know that, speak up. <laughs> we know that it, it's a development stage, and it happens, but you know why? Uh, you know, that's a good question. It, it could be related to hormones, but um, there are some loons in the winter that maintain the red eye. Usually adults will maintain a rusty red eye. It may not be as, as totally red as in the breeding, but your juveniles are more of a, a copperish brown or a muted brown. And from then on, they, they turn more red as they become an adult. The vitreous fluid in the adult is actually red. One of the uh, parts of loon conservation that ginger really enjoys studying, and that's in their, their foraging, what they use to feed. And during this winter in Mississippi and Louisiana, we were able to see a new chapter in what loons consume during the wintertime. We had no idea. You know, we, we are primarily observing them up here at these freshwater lakes where they breed. We know they eat fish here and a few crayfish. And in saltwater, they eat stingrays. They eat flounder. They eat octopus. They eat animals that look like they could just tear the loon apart. We didn't know anything about that, so we learned a lot this winter, and uh, we were very excited to learn that. The waters that we were in are chocolate brown. Loons can't possibly see where they're going in that murky water, yet they're foraging successfully. So we now know that they don't depend on vision purely to capture their foraging materials, to capture their prey. They've got some other sensory mechanisms going on that we probably don't understand fully. They can sense motion. They hear very, very acutely underwater. They can probably sense what's ahead of them, even though they can't see it. And oftentimes we see kind of a muddy breastbone on the bird, which suggests to us that they're just kind of down in the bottom, groping along until they run into something and they grab at it. And they just hope that it's not too big. <laughs> so uh, it, it's quite exciting. We, we found one loon down there that had a stingray barb in its breastbone. And it was stuck and we photographed that bird for several weeks. And then it eventually got wound up in some fishing line and we didn't see it from then on. So it perished. Typically, loons in the center of North America are smaller by a great extent than loons to the northwest and also to the northeast. The theory is if you're small, you can fly more efficiently and it's easier for you to fly to the interior of the continent. You're more likely to be able to make long migrations than a big heavy bird. You have to remember that flying for loons is, is a tough deal. It's a big effort. Yeah, like the um, south twin male, we know he migrates. He flies 30 miles for his winter territory, from his summer to his winter territory, one way. And he flies to Lake Pateros. We have seen him here for two, several years in a row now. And then in the spring, he can fly back 30 miles back to his breeding lake. And so he's kind of lazy. He comes back and forth because we have someone who has been watching for him a retired biologist, and is checking for his bands. He'll come back in the middle of the summer, you know, but that's not very far for him to go. So because we've banded these birds, we're able to learn things like that. We're able to construct this kind of a migration and movement pattern of the common loon in the Northwest. If they weren't banded, these other observers couldn't tell us that, hey, we're seeing the bird you know. We just wouldn't have any proof of that. We captured 19 common loons in the Gulf of Mexico this winter and put transmitters in two of those. And we learned a tremendous uh, new chapter about common loons. When we would have um, hours and days where we weren't working on our projects, we'd go work on the loons. 
But the loons, the two loons that have satellite implants, one is up, um, has flown almost directly inland, landed like in Tennessee on a reservoir, and then flew directly to Wisconsin. Uh, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And uh, it, they think it's on its way up to Canada. So instead of going to the the ocean side along the Atlantic, there these loons are going directly over land. So this is our first confirmation of a Gulf loon going back to its breeding lake. We're going to get into the conservation of the common loon uh, just a little bit, kind of wrap up our story this evening. As you know, we are conservationists with Loon Like Loon Association and also Biodiversity Research Institute in Gorham, Maine. The former breeding range of the common loon across North America. It is uh, shifted northward in the eastern part of the country a few tens to a few hundreds of miles in the west. We know that loons used to nest as far south as the Sierras in California. Uh, Idaho has no breeding common loons now. They had nine to ten about a decade ago. There's a little band of uh, common loon breeding in the Yellowstone ecosystem. So we're now pretty confident to say this is the southern limit of common loon breeding in northwestern North America. And if you were to calculate from California to where it is in Washington now, it's moving northward something like 15 miles per year. Uh, what's causing that is a very good question. And I wrote a paper on this that summarized really what I thought were the main contributors to it. Loss of habitat is way up there. More people, less places for loons. So this is quite a challenge for us to try to maintain the breeding range of the common loon here in the Northwest. Numbers of young of 29 Washington common loon nesting territories. We've kept track over the years since we started doing our research and our observations. And um, we're averaging about 6.7 young per year in the state of Washington. Young that actually... Uh, develop on these lakes. And at one time, we think it was a lot higher. When we started work on the common loon in the state of Washington, populations were really bottoming out. Since 2002, we've had a gradual upswing. The numbers vary quite, quite dramatically from year to year, which we know certainly is the norm in nature. We've got something like 12 to 13 to 14 nests per year in the state of Washington. Common loon mortalities. Now, since we started collecting dead common loons, we now have accumulated 29 in the state of Washington since we started our work. We don't know of a natural predator in the state of Washington for the common loon. There just, there aren't. There, in the oceans, there are. Well, the eagles are a predator, but we've for not. For the young. And for the, for young, the young, they get the chicks. But, but we've these not, are adults that we've been studying. We have not had a predation loon mortality be returned to us for any evaluation for a predator. We've seen eagles try to attack them, but we've never seen eagles get anything but eggs and chicks. Lead toxicosis is a large one. About 40% of all of the mortalities that we have studied since the late 90s have been from lead, 40%. That's Trauma. in Washington. Um, nationwide, many states have up to, it's more like 50 to 80 percent of all known loon mortalities are due to lead toxicosis. It's higher than natural trauma. Trauma happens when a bird flies into a tree, when it flies into a, a building. It gets it's hit by its a own boat. mistake. But uh, lead is caused only from our dispersal of lead into the environment. So uh, that's something that we've kind of looked into. We studied. 29 common loon carcasses over the years that we've been working with common loons and found that 39% of those died of lead toxicosis. We know that by taking them apart, getting to the gizzard, and finding lead sinkers, and oftentimes with fishing string in there. So basically, they can ingest lead two ways. They can pick it up off the bottom. They normally use stones in their gizzard to aid in digestion, and they can mistakenly pick up lead sinkers that are lost from fishing. They can also grab fish that are on the line, that a fisherman has caught. That fish is easier for them to capture. And at times of the year when they're trying to feed their young, when they're getting a little bit stressed for, for an abundance of food, they'll go after a fisherman's hooked fish. Uh, we have photographed several fish with grab marks 
on the fish after the fisherman has successfully reeled it in. We've been two different lakes where fishermen have lost their fish, and then the loon has gotten in trouble because of ingesting lead. So we've seen this happen. We saw it happen in the Gulf of Mexico this year with uh, several different birds. Once lead gets into the system of a common loon, it's, it's about 10, 12 to 14 days before it perishes. It cannot survive even uh, something the size of a, of a lead shot. Uh, lead is just that toxic. So we have a message here. It's, it's not a message to try to negate fishing. It's not a message to try to hamper fishing. We just think that we need an alternative to the lead part of fishing. Uh, we've put our science out there to the Fishing Commission. They read over our documentation, our studies that were done by us and various veterinarians. And a lot of other states are adopting a policy where there is no lead in the entire state and many of the Canadian provinces. So our challenge now is to let fishermen know that there are alternatives, where those alternatives are, how much they cost, and to get those more readily available. We think the environment's going to be better without the distribution of lead. Non-lead sinkers. Some are steel, some are tin, uh, split shot. There's a lot of different companies. Timmy, Ta or Tommy. Tommy Tin? Something like that makes beautiful jigs. Uh, a lot of fishermen use them in the south. That's where we became acquainted with them. And they don't even have any lead policies in the south, but they love his jigs so much, they use them everywhere. And they're all non-lead. So fishermen are still catching fish. But loons, if they ingest any lead at all, they expire. And Washington does not have enough loons as it is for maintaining their breeding population. And our juveniles, we have such a high mortality. It's something like 78%. We may have 6 to 10 juveniles that fledge every year. So breeding lakes is a beginning. If we lose our breeding pairs, we don't have replacements for them. And uh, I'll be the first person to stand here and say that 99% of the fishermen are, are doing their best at eliminating their problem. And it's unfortunate that lead still gets away. It's, it's impossible to control it all. Uh, there's a variety of ways that lead can be lost, and it's not easy to recover. And then it's available to not only loons, but a long, long list of other species. Mercury is another problem. Mercury gets into the environment primarily by burning fossil fuels. Mercury is something that progressively builds up in your system over the years, and it doesn't go away. It can kind of add from year to year and get higher in toxicity into your system until finally you have ill effects from it. A lot of the mercury is airborne. It comes down from the atmosphere and lands everywhere. It it's no respecter of, of where it lands, in forests and lake surfaces, uh, oceans. Yeah, there's a lot of mercury sources. You know, we have them in thermometers. We have it. It's in a lot of industrial coal mining. The Columbia River, as you know, is contaminated from mercury. So, and we get mercury from China, and the northeast part of the United States has a lot of coal-fired plants with mercury. So we, we're studying mercury and loons, and we're learning a lot. What we can tell from the mercury is we do two studies. One is feather and one is blood. Blood is within the last three months. So if the blood mercury is high and we have that loon on a breeding lake, we can go back and see if that loon was there. And yes, he picked up mercury on probably on that lake, his breeding lake. And then the feathers indicate uh, mercury bioaccumulates. Every time we capture the loons and recapture them, we check their mercury level. And the Bonaparte male we caught three times, and each time we caught him in his age progression, the mercury elevated, his feather mercury, his bioaccumulated methylmercury also elevated as he aged. And so uh, he was getting it from both the, the winter and the summer. Years ago, many lakes did an, a volunteer testing throughout the United States to evaluate mercury in fish. Because loons were dying from mercury back east, and they did find through many studies that fish also were high in mercury. So I think most states, and Washington was one of them, established a, a lead and a mercury program. 
and you can go onto their website and check Bonaparte Lake. They will tell you what, it'll show you what the mercury levels are, what year it was tested, and they did put out advisories, high advisories for some lakes that pregnant women and children should not eat fish from this lake. Loon Lake has some high mercury levels. That's where we live. And the bass there have very high mercury levels. So, Another way that uh, loons and a lot of other seabirds perish by bycatch, many states have modified their capture nets to allow birds to escape. And we don't know what that status is in Washington. As far as we know, there are no such laws in Washington. But Lake Michigan and some of the Northwest, they've actually modified their nets so that birds can get away. The upper part of them are changed to allow the birds to get free. They have uh, it in Washington, but it's for smaller birds, the mur- muralettes and that. Recreation so. is, is something that we all love to do. That's something that infringes on, on common loons. That's just an a anthropogenic consequence. Uh, people love to recreate and be out there and enjoy it. Loons have adapted to that. They learn to stay out of the way for the most part. In closing, we developed a fund that we had people donate to purchase fingerlings to put into these different lakes. We have and four lakes in Washington where the chicks, there's not enough small fry for chicks, so we have to add. Ferry Lake was one of them. Swan Lake is another. Long Lake is another one. The state was stocking these lakes with catchable size fish for the fishermen, but young chicks can't eat catchable size fish, so that we enticed them to also add fingerlings to that initial plant. Mm-hmm. So they started doing that. And so then we started successfully rearing young off of these lakes. Mm-hmm. That was quite a success story. If any of you have any observations about loons on lakes, you see any bands at all on loons, please write them down. Note where it was the day and call us, email us, give us the information. It really helps. And if you have any fishing line entanglement or loons that you think have fishing line, call us. We'll come out and evaluate it. Anything Mm -hmm. that you can do to help us with loon conservation, and even in the winter, because a lot of you live in an area where the loons are here overwintering, please call us any time of the year. We're, we're real interested and would like to help. We thank you very much. Thank you. We've got moons on our shoulders and stars in our eyes. This podcast is produced by Okanagan Highlands Alliance. OHA is located in Tenasket, a town in the heart of the Okanagan Valley of North Central Washington. We are inspired by the beauty and diversity of the landscape that surrounds us, from the aspen and conifer forests, to the highland lakes, to the tumbling creeks that descend to the wide, glacier-carved Okanagan River Valley. We engage in environmental advocacy, habitat restoration, and educational activities in our efforts to protect local ecosystems for future generations. To learn more about OHA or to become a member, please visit our website, okanaganhighlands.org. Thanks to Ginger and Daniel Polishuk for providing the presentation and the story of Washington's not-so-common loon. The theme song is written and performed by Tyler Graves and Andy Kingham. Mm -hmm.